been a while, hasn't it? Welcome to Smash It Reviews. In this video, I will be talking about House on Sorority Row, but before I get into that, I definitely need to say a few things. One, um, with everything that was going on and is still going on, I wanted to take a bit of time off to worry about myself, my health, and my mental health. Second, we were doing renovations, so I couldn't exactly take the time, find the time, to watch and write out my review. I have ADHD, so it's hard for me to keep my brain like my mind on one thing and one thing only and just talk about it straight up. I have to write it down in an order otherwise I'm I'm just stuck. I stutter, it's bad. So the glare that you see and have been seeing, I write all of my stuff out on Google Docs and I pull it up on my TV which is behind my camera and I read it uh, I read all I try my best to not look at it all the time. Okay. Now, let's um now I got all that out of the way, let's get to what you're really here for. In November 1982, House on Sorority Row had a, a limited theatrical release uh, before expanding worldwide on January 21st, 1983. This movie stars Catherine McNeil, Eileen Davidson, Lois Kelso Hunt, Janice Zido, Zito, Robin Malloy, Michael Kuhn, Kuhn and Charles Serio. And of course, more. This movie does uh, have a uh, remake, reimagining, called Sorority Row, which came out in 2009. And I also have seen that one too. The synopsis for this film is as follows Seven sorority sisters throw a graduation party and play a prank that goes horribly wrong. Ending up with a dead body, they panic and try to hide it but someone witnessed the crime and begins to murder them one by one in this cult classic. It is also deemed a cult classic. That's what I forgot to mention. Well, you know what's next. The movie starts off with a uh, young Slater giving birth in looked like an orphanage. Uh, Dr. Beck, um, after she gave birth, Dr. Beck, the doctor that told her, um, he tells her that the baby didn't make it. Uh, but later on, you know, it's revealed that the child did make it, and he's living in a clinic. His name was Eric, and he suffered deformities and uh, mental and, me and mentally and was mentally underdeveloped because Dr. Beck, uh, the doctor that Slater went to see, gave her an illegal fertility, fertility treatment. Which, you know, in turn caused his deformities and his mental illnesses. This mental underdevelopment. Which, I'm gonna guess it kept him in a childlike, in like in a childlike state of mind. Yeah. That's, I'm pretty sure that's what that means. Slater then grew up, got older, you know, after the whole thing with the birth thing and everything else. She grew up, got older, and is now the house mother? Den mother? No, not the scouts. House mother? I think it's called the house mother. Of a sorority. Now, these girls at this sorority do not like Slater for the life of them. They, she, they just think she's too strict, too stern, and they decide to prank her after she tells them that they, they're not allowed to have a party for graduation, or you know, and just to go home. I'm gonna go ahead and mention now that she closed the sorority every year on June 19th, which is Eric's birthday, um, so she can bring Eric from the clinic to the house to live with her over the summer so they can celebrate, you know, his birthday and just spend time together. Now, she also splashed up Vicky's waterbed. Vicky is the brains behind the prank. She's the one that actually led it into full development. Um, she organized the whole plot for the prank. Now, you know, sometimes you see this kind of thing, you know, people prank the person they hate or they prank the person that deserves it, you know. So they decide to prank her and it works at first, but Vicky, you know, Vicky ends up, you know, she's shooting blanks uh, at Slater. Now, see, this is where I'm still, this is where I'm still thinking maybe she did this on purpose. She shot the gun again, not knowing that there was a literal bullet in the chamber, or in the mag, in the magazine. 
It was a net. Um, yeah, she... So, you know, Slater's dead. Because Vicky's dumbass mistake. So they hide her body, but in the most obvious and public place, there's a swimming pool that's, I think, behind the house. Behind the sorority house. Now, yes, the pool is, you know, dirty and murky and full of... It's green, you know, but someone could have easily cleaned it, like, drained it and cleaned it and found the body if they had not have did that shit. So, unknowing to them. So, you know, unbeknownst to them, Eric saw the whole thing from the attic and, you know, they saw her, they saw them, he saw them kill her and hide her body in the pool. So, you know, after seeing them do that, put two and two together right quick. Just go ahead and make, do a little math. What's the answer? You guessed it. So he slaughtered them all, except for one, but that is debatable and unknown. Because um, the movie ended, because after uh, the final girl, I'm going to call her the final girl, because technically that's what she is, um, she threw him over the balcony. She threw Eric over the balcony. And, you know, you ever seen Halloween where you think he's dead, but then he opens his eyes and he gets up and walks off and he's not there? So, he opens his eyes, but then right then and there, the movie ends, right? The movie ends. So, you know, it's debatable if she's alive or not. So yeah, uh, the plot was, uh, I'd say the plot was one of a kind. Um, a prank, you know, goes wrong and you end up killing the person that you're pranking by accident or on purpose. And all in all, I did like the twist at the end of, like, just overall, I did like the twist. Even though I was kind of still, like, I was kind of expecting it. I was kind of expecting Eric, the child, to be involved somehow, because why else would they show that scene in the beginning of the movie? Okay, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I want to talk about the attic in which Eric stayed in. There was some stuff in there that kind of shows or links to Eric's illnesses and his problems. The dead birds, for one. You know, they could have died of natural causes, but, and they could have just, like, started rotting and stuff, but that's not what that looked like. That's some pure serial killer shit. I've seen enough shit. I've seen enough stuff to know. I've seen enough to know. But I'm, like I said, I'm not too sure. Uh, the Jack in the Box and the clown costumes, though. The little, the little clown, the little guy in the Jack in the Box. This, uh, this little fella right here. Um, seemed to play a reference as to what was going to happen later on. Not only did this little clown show up, but Eric wearing a clown costume that looked identical to the one in the Jack in the Box. The attic is just, you know, it was full of little things that hint toward his illnesses, and that's a part of the set that caught my eye the most. It's not necessarily how the, like, the set that was built, but just the items that were on set. I gotta start adding that in. I understand. It was the early 80s. Censorship was real, my dude. You know, it definitely did not allow excessive amounts of gore, but yet partial, sometimes full frontal female nudity was allowed. So no blood, but here's some boobs. Which I'm not complaining. <laughs> there was very little. Very little. Sometimes, you know, whenever there was, you could definitely tell that it was fake. I'm honestly not complaining because, like I said, I get it. I get it. Gore and showing it was slowly but surely coming into the 80s, but when it did happen, they would have to keep it at least an R rating, otherwise it would have been deemed NC-17 during the time. Is my mic on? <laughs> In some parts, the acting was okay. Uh, some of the deaths were a little overacted, like they didn't even try or were just being a little too dramatic. Uh, there was one scene, oh my god, I don't know, I don't know if it was just bad script reading or, you know, if she actually was supposed to read it like this, but, and, you know, she was supposed to be portrayed that way, because Morgan, her name, the character's name was Morgan, she was supposed to be portrayed as, like, a southern girl, like a southern belle type, type, uh, type lady, which, that's the vibe that she gave off, I, but, <laughs> the line that she said, I can't remember what it was. I think it was, how do we know she is alive? 
<laughs> the way she said it. I don't, like I said, I don't, I, it made me laugh. I don't know, like, if they even, like, even if they did tell her to read it like that, of course, of course, it still adds to the scene. But it did give you a, it did give us a slight laugh. Yeah, she only had like what, four lines overall anyway. She she was like I think the second one to die. Not much to say about this. Honestly, you know I can't say much about the dialogue. I really can't. You know, it was honestly very thorough. You know, aside from like the bad line that was read, you know, the dialogue was stable. You know, it got to the point, it didn't hold back with the storyline, so the dialogue for once I have nothing bad to say about it. My favorite part. So the score was composed by Richard Band. The opening is very bright, you know, almost like happy like, like your, you know, your serene type sounds, it's like sounding music. But the rest of the score was dramatic, suspenseful. There was a recurring theme though, a recurring theme between, you know, like, like most of the OSTs for the scenes that were used for the scenes, composed and used for the scenes. That was the music that played in the uh, from the Jack in the Box. You know, the, I can't even fucking remember how it went, but it was like a little, like a little chime. A little, it was like a, almost, it kind of sounded like a, like a, like an instrumental for a nursery rhyme. Um, that's what I liked about the composed music. It had bits of the toy box music infused with almost each one that we heard. So, and overall, that was that was a good um, addition to the actual cue for every scene that was that was done. You know, I really like this movie. I liked the overall plot and the storyline and the idea that was created. I even liked that it was, you know, majority and all female cast. Um, it would have been cool if the serial, if the killer itself was female, but still, because you don't get, uh, you don't get many of those in like movies. Real life, maybe. Movies, not so, not so much. Um, everything that I discussed, every like basic thing that I discussed in my checklist. Fuck, my battery's low. Basically, uh, sums up my overall thoughts of the film, so there's no more that needs to be said. <laughs> Looks like you made it to the end of this video! Thank you for watching and being patient as always. Be sure to leave a like and a comment sharing what you thought of the movie. And if you've seen the remake, leave a comment about that. Um, I'm glad to hear your thoughts. I've seen it too. I've seen, you know, I've seen that, I've seen that one too. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on our social media. Links are down below in the description. I am back, and I'm back for good. And up next, I will be reviewing... we will do a little shuffle. All right. So yeah, up next, I will be reviewing... Cyberstalking. So thank you again for watching and being patient, like I said. Oh, that down. I am back. I'm back for good. I am smashing. I will see you.